Hello, and welcome to Things We Said Today, our weekly podcast about anything and everything to do with the Beatles, both as a group and as solo artists, past, present, things to come, whatever we can come up with. I'm Alan Cozen, the author of The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop, and got that something, how the Beatles' I Want to Hold Your Hand changed everything, and the former, now retired Beatles desk at the New York Times. And I have with me my three regular esteemed co-hosts, Ken Michaels, who you know is the host of the syndicated radio show, Every Little Thing, uh, and who is now going to be doing his imitation of the late, great Scott Muni. He has a horrible cold. Uh, Ken, how are you doing besides having a horrible cold? I'm doing okay, I think. Uh, <laughs> I have to be ready for the to be on the radio tomorrow morning, so... Uh, we may be uh, listening to me a little bit less on the show today. Actually, I'm not sounding. I'm just putting that on, but this is not yeah, people, my best voice anyway. <laughs> people were going to think we were, you know, sort of having someone else fake being you there for me. <laughs> um, okay, well, um, have some hot tea, and we will move on to Steve Marinucci, probably the world's only full-time Beatles reporter now. You can read his work in... Billboard.com and Access.com, which is AXS.com. Um, and he is also the author of a book about the monkeys, Meet a Monkey, Davy Jones. Hello, Steve. Hello, Alan. Hello, everyone. Thank you for those nice hey. words, by the way. Hey, anytime. <laughs> and, and we have Al Sussman, the executive editor of Beetle Fan Magazine and the author of the book Change in Times, 101 Days That Shaped a Generation. Hello, Al. Hi, Alan. Hello there, everybody. And we have a special guest this week, uh, who is Brad Hunt, a contributing editor at Beatle Fan. Um, I believe this month is the 30th anniversary of his very first piece in Beatle Fan, um, which makes us a little bit weighted towards Beatle Fan, because I'm also a contributing editor, and Al, as you've heard, is the executive editor. So welcome, Brad. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay. One reason we have Brad is Brad today is that Brad does a lot of Beatle fans' book reviews, and today we're going to talk about books. But first, we have an item of Beatles news that you probably have all run into in the past few days, which is the death of Alexis Mardis, famously known as Magic Alex. Anyone broken no. up about that? <laughs> you know, normally, normally we wish that people rest in peace and stuff like that. But Alex has an awful lot to answer for, um, and as someone who has been sued by Magic Alex, um, or actually the, the New York Times was, um, because of a piece I wrote in which I mentioned just in passing. Um, it was about the Maharishi, and I pointed out that um, one of the reasons that, that John and George left the ashram um, in 1968 when they went to study with the Maharishi was because Magic Alex went down there and began spreading rumors about the Maharishi and making passes at women, and uh, assuming that most readers wouldn't know who Magic Alex was, I had to identify him, so I identified him with the phrase um, charlatan and supposed inventor. Alex took exception to these things, <laughs> all of them. <laughs> uh, no, he, uh, really? <laughs> Um, also, also, you know, part of the thesis of the piece was that, you know, the, the Beatles actually, you know, you know, a lot of us think of the trip to the Maharishi as just sort of, you know, some weird blip mm -hmm. that they went through. But from my point of view, the cultural yield was huge because you know, up through Pepper, which was their previous album before they went, they had been turning up in the studio with songs half written and finishing them there, which they had the luxury to do because, you know, they were coining money for EMI and they have as much studio time as they wanted they went to rishikesh and wrote songs you know every every time whenever they weren't meditating they were writing songs they came home and they recorded you know 27 songs for the isher demos 
21 of those got used on the White Album, which had 30 songs, plus Hey Jude and Revolution, so that's 32, plus Not Guilty and What a Shame, Mary Jane Had a Pain at the Party, or What's the New Mary Jane. That brings the total up to 34, plus the six remaining songs from the Isher demos that weren't used. That's 40 songs. There, there was no other time in the Beatles' history when before going in to record an album, they had 40 songs, 40 new songs written, 27 of them demoed. Um, so my feeling was that, you know, whatever the trip was, even if it was just because they got away from London or whatever, but this trip and their involvement with the Maharishi and, and John Lennon said specifically it wasn't just being away, it was the meditating. And this was after John broke with the Maharishi, he said that you know, was was a big deal. So the question then was, why did they break with the Maharishi? And they broke with the Maharishi because of Alex. Um, and I just mentioned that, you know, it, it, really tongue in cheek that, you know, maybe if they hadn't broken with the Maharishi, they'd have done, you know, a, a double album every six months. Um, obviously, <laughs> it was a joke. But Alex um, actually sued us for that, too, because he interpreted it as an assertion that, because of him, the Beatles became less creative. The lawsuit dragged on for about two years, cost the Times about a million and a half dollars at a time when it was um, laying off journalists. Um, a million and a half dollars was roughly 15 New York Times salaries. And it was a completely frivolous lawsuit. And... Um, in the end, we settled with him. We didn't give him any money, but we let him affix a statement to my story, which is still there, and you can read it, in which he says at the very end, after giving his um, fantasy versions of how he didn't really build a recording studio for the Beatles and all of the everything that everybody else says is untrue, um, he says, you know, it said that, the Beatles were more were more creative during the Maharishi period, but they did some of their most beloved recordings after they broke up, like Imagine, proving that he is a charlatan. <laughs> so I'm terribly sorry. I'm not. I, I, I am not. Uh, you know that upset about Alex's passing, and I know that 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 upsets people because you're supposed to be upset about anybody who dies. But um, you know, yeah. He has a lot to answer for, as I say. Uh, anyone have any comments about Magic Alex beyond all of that? Well, actually, didn't Paul and Ringo leave India before John and George? Yes. Ringo left early because of his uh, stomach ailments and also he didn't like the bugs. Um, Paul had said that he would be going to India for a specific amount of time, and he stayed for that specific amount of time and then left. And what he left to do basically was essentially to set up Apple in his own image, as it were. Mm -hmm. And in a way, his leaving early set the stage for some other battles down the road. So that left John and, and George. And George did not believe Alex's assertions, but let himself get talked into leaving by John. John then went and wrote Sexy Sadie, which he originally called Maharishi, and George said to him, look, this is ridiculous, you know, you can't do that, and talked him into changing it to Sexy Sadie and apparently came up with the title. Yeah, but by the time Alex turned up, it was just John and George left. Hmm. Um, one of the things that Alex did, which he claims in his statement to the Times actually happened, but um, basically, basically everybody in the Beatles compound either wrote or spoke about what happened, and they unanimously say that this didn't ever happen because the Beatles found the plan, uh, you know, John and George found the plan too creepy. What Alex did is he enlisted a woman who was in the ashram to go in and have you know a lesson with the Maharishi, and the Beatles were supposed to be waiting outside his compound, um, and at a certain point she would scream – regardless what the Maharishi was doing or not doing, and John and George would thereby catch Maharishi red-handed, making a pass at this woman. But they didn't go. They wouldn't go. They said, you know, we're not going to do that. But they did sort of believe his story, that the Maharishi was doing these things. Mia Farrow wrote a book saying that he had hugged yeah. her in a way that, that she found uh, 
sexual, but she um, clarified for, you know, our lawyers went and interviewed a lot of these people, too, um, for, for the case. And she said, you know, I was wrong about that. I, I, you know, looking back at it now, it was just, you know, a, a hug, like a hug of greeting. Um, and I just sort of overreacted. Hmm. So, hmm. yeah, we got a lot of we got a lot of interesting material. And in fact, I'm, I'm planning to do a book. Um <laughs> Which is going to be called, at least if I have anything to do with it, it's going to be called Charlatan Cold. <laughs> <laughs> the Beatles, Magic Alex, The New York Times, and, and British Libel Law. Because I, I, I neglected to mention, he sued us in Britain. In Britain, there is this thing called libel tourism. Nobody in the case has to be British. Alex, at the time of the suit, lived in Greece. We... New York Times was in the United States. No one in the suit was British or in Britain. Okay, <laughs> but you can charge anyone with libel in Britain and have a case there. And among the things that we found, and one of the reasons that we ended up settling with him, is that, for instance, a word, the definition of a word with which you supposedly libel someone is not admissible in court as part of your argument that you didn't libel him. So charlatan, according to the OED, not even an American dictionary, the Oxford English Dictionary, charlatan means someone who claims to have knowledge or ability that he doesn't have. I mean, they might as well have a picture of Alex there. <laughs> uh, but we weren't allowed to say that. You know, he was asserting that charlatan implied some sort of criminality and you know, criminal hucksterism. And a case actually could be made. But nevertheless, uh, the other thing is that we had to prove that if, if Alex was spreading rumors in Rishikesh, we had to prove that he knew that they were untrue. We had to, in other words, prove that we knew what was in Alex's mind in 1968. And the philosophical impossibility of that is obvious. You know, I, I can't prove what any of you guys are thinking right now when we're sitting right, you know, here. So, <laughs> yeah, you know, so it, it just was an impossible suit. If anyone wants to know about the legal uh, system in Britain and you haven't read Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels, um, <laughs> oh. there is a fantastic section about British law there. And that was the 1700s. And it's just the same. I mean, what he says basically is. If I hath a mind to my neighbor's cow, all I need to do is prove that the cow is rightfully my neighbor's and the court will award it to me. <laughs> so, yeah. but, it, yeah. but it goes on at much greater and more hilarious length. Yeah. Now, oh, the story was published in the International Herald Tribune, and that gave him the opening to file the no. suit? Uh, no, he sued the International Herald Tribune as well. Mm -hmm. as the New York Times, and there was a newspaper in Greece that happened to include us, the story that day, and so he sued us through them in Greece as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, it was okay. basically a shakedown. You know, what we mm. didn't know was that um, Alex, in recent decades, had started a side career you know, uh, suing any newspaper that basically mentioned him and, and said, you know, what his story with regard to the Beatles was about what his inventions were about his recording studio. Basically anyone who mentioned the history was sued. And in England, they have a tradition of, you know, basically having a, a budget line in their annual budgets for nuisance suits and they paid him <laughs> off and he went away. And so those things were mostly not reported. We didn't get to find out about them until it was too late. At the New York Times, they took the position that if we are correct and the facts seem to be on our side, and in the course of this case, I wrote – this was the whole, – the whole story was maybe 1,200 words long. I ended up writing a 17,000-word court statement using <laughs> every single quote by everybody who ever wrote or commented upon the Beatles and Magic Alex and Rishikesh and – what happened and you know it, it it's pretty unanimous now that said um mark lewison um who we'll talk about in a while 
because he has found so much in the Beatles story as he's researching it that is at odds with what we know, has been including you know, the idea that Magic Alex is a charlatan as one of the things he may or may not disprove when it comes down to it. I, frankly, am not sure how he's going to disprove that, yeah. uh, but, you know, maybe he can. Uh, you know, we have Alex's very long statement, apart from what the Times published of his statement, uh, along with my piece. Um, I have a, a much longer version of that that was his original court statement which I'm sharing with Mark. If Mark wants to use any of that material, you know, hmm. that's fine. In theory, my book should be out long before volume three of... So, you know, and so he may end up proving me totally wrong and proving everybody who's ever written about Alex totally wrong. Uh, that remains to be seen, but I'd be very, very surprised. And uh, But, hey, Mark has surprised us. Already, so we shall see. So, I guess with no further ado, we should move on to the book section of the show. Uh, and speaking of Mark, um, I think what we have, what we decided to do was each pick five um, favorite Beatles books or books that we consider the best. Or uh, I guess what was the definition? Either, I guess either, either or. Yeah, yeah. And it occurred to us since we only have five. And since Mark has written, let's see, one, two, three, four, at least, uh, well, five books that are basically on everybody's must list, we're going to stipulate that, generally speaking, unless one of us, one or more of us, wants to include Mark as one of our measly five books, we're going to stipulate in advance that Mark's books are obviously the standard reference. Uh, tune in, uh, the first volume of his trilogy about the Beatles is revolutionary. It's changed what we know about a lot of that part of the Beatles story up to December 31st, 1962. Mm -hmm. um, not least, it gave us an idea of how much there was to say about up to December 31st, 1962, when they'd only been signed for a couple of months. Mm -hmm. uh, his Beatles recording sessions book, uh, again, standard reference, the Complete Beatles Chronicle embodies a shorter, condensed version of the recording sessions book, plus information that was in his very first book, The Beatles Live, which is now out of print, and it's a collector's item. And uh, I remember spending time in England looking for it, um, but apparently it hadn't come out yet. Everybody knew it was coming out, and everybody, you know, even then knew that this was going to be something extraordinary. So, but I won't say any more about them because I, I think possibly some of you may include anyway, and I'll, I'll leave them to you. So we'll go around the proverbial virtual table, and we'll start with Brad as okay. our uh, visiting All right. book reviewer. Yeah, yeah. I uh, I came in with a list of thirteen books, so. Uh, Tried to narrow it down to five. It's a, it's a little hard to do. I'm going to throw a couple of honorable mentions in. And these are really in no particular order. You could say it's like five books in base two or something. Mm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. Well, Can't Buy Me Love from Jonathan Gould. Mm -hmm. um, Growing Up with the Beatles from Ron Schomburg. Mm. Uh, All Together Now uh, from Wally Pedrajic and Harry Castleman. Some Fun Tonight, the Chuck Gunderson um, Look at the Beatles Tours, and uh, The Beatles Forever from Nicholas Schaffner, mm. and as an honorable mention, I'm going to put the Beatles Anthology. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I guess we'll, uh, as we, we go around, you'll, maybe you'll be able to mention more of your honorable mentions. Right. Um, and, and why, and as you, why and those... As you, oh, go ahead, Al. No, that's okay. I was going to ask you, why, why the five that you made your main list? Well, I think... I think Can't Buy Me Love, which came out around 10 years ago, it's very well written, first of all, and it looks at the Beatles from a musical point of view, a kind of biographical point of view, and also examines the wider culture that they came from. I remember reading it, and um, there's a passage in Can't Buy Me Love where he's talking about 
the how kind of the foundation was set for the Beatles to uh, their arrival in America and about how the movie Tom Jones had won an Oscar the year before for Best Picture and the kitchen sink realism of movies like Look Back in Anger and things like that. And it was just sort of, I remember just sort of having like a, just a eureka moment of like going, yes, I mean, that's really a good point and something that I had never really thought about before and no one had ever really explored before in, in any other Beatles book. And um, so that, uh, that's why I would choose Can't Buy Me Love. Growing Up with the Beatles um, was one of the first Beatles books I ever read. Uh, I got it for Christmas in 1976 when I was just about to turn 11. And um, for people who haven't read it, it's a kind of every, if you want to call it an every fan, story about uh, discovering the Beatles in 1964. And then Ron Schomburg graduated from high school in 1970, just as they were breaking up. And... Um, he talks about his life while and also incorporates um, what's going on with the Beatles at that point and how they were changing and how they were changing and how he was changing. And uh, the Prodrashik uh, altogether now, that's just a standard reference. And Harry and Wally, it's just a pioneering book. And it's a book that I, I have multiple copies of it. And I know my first copy and ended up uh, being held together by, like, duct tape mm -hmm. by the time I was done with it. <laughs> because it, it's, such, it, it's such an indispensable reference book. And um, Some Fun Tonight, the Chuck Gunderson book, I mean, it's just a gem of a book. It, you have to just appreciate the shoe leather work he put into um, compiling this book. And if you have, it's out in paperback now, but if you have the original edition, which he self-published, and it's in hardback, the, the reproduction of the photos and the, the quality of the um, material he puts in, uh, the contracts and things like that, it's just fantastic. And uh, The Beatles Forever from Nicholas Schaffner, that's another one of the early Beatles books I read. It'll be 40 years ago that it was out um, this fall. And it's a beautiful piece of writing and also a beautiful piece of writing for someone who was only 24 at that time. And I think it might have been one of the first books to kind of put the Beatles within a kind of broader cultural context. And also, for me... Growing up in Toledo, Ohio at that point, where a Beatles convention was not up the street and record stores were kind of so-so, the collection of memorabilia that he has on display in that book is just, it was eye-opening. Mm -hmm. So, um, And then, of course, the Beatles anthology, kind of my honorable mention. I think in the review I wrote for Beatle Fan, I said something like, it's a Genesis Publications book that's actually kind of affordable. Yeah. That was my take on it. Um, it, it was just That's a nice... actually true, too, because yeah. Genesis did put it together. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that, that's one of those things where if I ever pick up the Beatles anthology now and I open it just to any random page, I really run the risk of sitting there for a half hour just kind of perusing it. Yeah. Yeah, so those are my thoughts, at least, on the ones that I wrote down. And I'm sure I, we could talk about some of the other ones that I wrote later on, too. Okay. Yeah. You may be able to thank me for the fact that if you open the anthology book, you can sit there for hours, um, because Brian Roylance, the founder of Genesis, um, came to New York and showed me some of his early uh, mock-ups of things of, of what the anthology book was going to be. And um, basically, it was a lot of pictures and large, you know, short quotes in large type. And it was, it was like a lot mm. of Genesis books now, um, you know, where it's, it's largely graphics, you know, I mean, that, that became what they specialized in in a certain way. And I said, you know, Brian, my favorite books of yours are Derek Taylor's 50 Years Adrift, mm. and, you know, the early ones where they're very, very text heavy, you know, and you've got all of the interviews with these guys. You've got to just publish a lot of that material in the book that we're not going to hear on the TV show where it's excerpted as yeah. sound bites. Yeah. And he said, really, you think so? And we, we went back and forth about it for a while. 
And then when I went over to England to uh, do some reporting for the Times on the anthology, um, I spent some time with Derek Taylor, who obviously felt the same way. I mean, Derek was a writer, and he felt that a book should be text. And so I, I told him that. And at one point, when I was interviewing Neil Aspinall, Derek was in the room sitting at the table, and he said, oh, um, why don't you tell Neil what you told me? Brian about this. <laughs> and so I made you know and, and obviously Derek was enlisting me to a cause that he was already fighting so you can thank Derek too and as it turned out there ended up being an awful lot of text in it so I, I, I feel a little responsible for, for some of the degree to which it's text heavy. thank you Alan hey anytime oh. you know I'm just doing my thing yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so who wants to be next? We'll continue giving Ken a rest for a bit and move on to Steve. Okay. Um, I kind of did a little, uh, maybe a little different thing. Is uh, I tried to pick most of the books from the non-reference section. I tried. It was sure as heck wasn't easy um, yeah. because so many of the reference books are so good. Um, And I'm going to mention um, several of them um, real quickly. Um, I mean, uh, all together now, of course, you have to mention that. I think I I first bought that, the paperback, but um, I finally got a a hardback version in the past few years uh, just because. But, yeah, I have so many copies of that. It's ridiculous. But uh, there's a couple of other... Uh, reference books that should be mentioned that if you don't have they're worth looking for the books by Neville Stannard um, starting with Long and, Wi- Long and Winding Road I man I spent so much time in those books back and they were they were not cheap because they were they were mm. British and those are those are really good sorry if I mention if I mash up this name completely Horg George Piper the, his film and TV chronicles, um, both for the Beatles years and the solo years, those are also really good. And there's also the um, the anthology of Beatle records, Yesterday, Today, and Tomorrow, and Always by Alex Bagaroff, and any of the Azing Maltmaker books, which are the, which are a Beatle geek. Those are just real geeky. But anyway, off the, off the of the geeky, uh... yeah. I mean, he's got he's got every you That's know. He's about twenty three so far. Has he got that? Has he got that many? I I mean, I I haven't seen any new know. ones. I haven't seen any new ones recently. I know he's, um, I know he put out a bunch of them a few years ago. I don't know that he's still doing them. But non reference books, I'd have to go with uh, longest cocktail ride by Richard mm-hmm. Bellello, which is the uh, one of the you know it's a great inside look at Apple and it doesn't mm-hmm. spare any doesn't you know it's the cra- the whole craziness of the, you know the whole thing I'd agree with Brad about Beatles Forever that it's such a joy to read uh, what a great writer he was uh, Ticket to Ride by Larry Kane because of the mm-hmm. inside view of the, the tour that he gives and he re- it wasn't unlike um, Hunter Davies Beatles biography, which I kind of have to mention, only because I, you know, it it was what it is. Um, he didn't, he, you know, he didn't. Uh, I mean, he was pretty uh, honest with his portrayal of them. So that would be a, another one. Uh, Love me D- and Love me do by Michael Braun is another um, book. Unfortunately, some of these books now. Are just so expensive. Chuck Gunderson's would be is also great. Um, I you know I can't not mention Chuck. You know, but some of these books now are getting so expensive, and that's a that's a really too bad because you know some of these things are just great reading. Um, and there's just so there are so many more that I I didn't even mention. I mean, but but yeah, those are there. You go. You know, as far as geek stuff goes. Malt makers are as geeky as they get. I mean, with all the the stuff he has pictured in the in the books, you know, those are amazingly crazy. But I really like the George Piper books. I've referred to those often in my in my work. So there we go. Yeah, I love me do. I didn't. I never even found a copy of that till I went to England for the first time in 1989. Really? I, I think it was first published here in like 1995. 
around the time of the anthology, and it's out of print again. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's available on Kindle, I think. But if you want to find an actual physical copy, it'll cost you a few bucks. Is it on Kindle? I didn't know it was on Kindle. I think it might be. I looked on Amazon, and oh, and okay. I, I'm, I, I think it is. Okay, that that would be that's but news. Was, that's news to it me. It was originally published in England in like 1964, though, right? Yeah. Well, yes. Yeah. And it was. It was it's, it's an incredible book because it captures the Beatles in a very candid way before they hit it big. Mm-hmm. They're mm-hmm. really it about to come to the United States. In fact, yeah. did, did we accompany them to the United States? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 So we 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 get a bit of reporting on that, but you know they were not yet. The Beatles that we, as we know them in a way, you know. Let me mention one more book. Of all the books that analyze their music, I have to, and and, and I'm not saying it because you're sitting, you're here in the room, Alan, but your book, and and also, I have to, I have to be honest. Is he thanks me in the book, so I can't, I have to, <laughs> I have to say that too. But your analysis versus some of the others is much, you know, is much better than than the others that are out there. So. There you go. Shots. <laughs> there you go. I'm well, done. I, yeah, I, you know, when Alan's book, I, Alan's book is actually on my my extended list here, mm-hmm. and I think Alan's book came out about a year after a book called Revolution in the Head by mm-hmm. Ian McDonald, oh, right. yeah. which I think is grossly overrated. And I think mm-hmm. Alan's book was a much better, provided much better analysis than that book. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, and so, there's a, there's another I, I, there's another one too. I enjoyed and I writing that book, you know. I mean, it, that was um that was it was like one of those things where it basically was sort of a brain dump of everything I've been thinking about for the last you know ten fifteen years before it, maybe more, ninety five, mm-hmm. maybe thirty years. And you know the 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 problem with it was that um, I also had that Japanese book of the transcriptions, you know, which was the 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 first most accurate bunch of transcriptions of Beatles tunes in musical notation and tablature. And so mm. I, I, as I got to something I was writing about, I'd pick up a guitar and I'd open the book and say, let's see what this feels like, because they would use, in most cases, the actual chord voicings the Beatles were using. I mean, anyone who plays knows there are a million different ways to play a chord on the guitar. And, and so he was, they were giving you what I, I guess they determined was the actual voicings, and they felt really good to play. Mm-hmm. Even some of the usual chord progressions, you're saying, oh, now I understand how that works. You know? <laughs> um, oh. And and I would then say, let's let's do the next one. And it, you know, it wasn't getting any writing done. I was just sitting there playing the stuff. So that was, you know, that became a little time consuming, but I, I, I just wanted to know what the stuff felt like from the inside. And, you know, I mean, as, as, a, as a kid in a band, we just took what we could off the records and didn't really necessarily think about the way they were doing it. Mm-hmm. This book sort of sort of snuck a mini review of that book in right there, you see. Um, <laughs> this was called The Beatles Scores. Anyway, uh, uh, so, mm-hmm. Ken, should we, should we go on to you? Um, or Sure. Do you, okay. Why not? But again, I caution my listeners, I'm not in full voice here. So please forgive me, you know, and <laughs> hopefully I'll be at least at 50%. But um, my top five here, I had to give two of Mark Lewison's book, books, Equal Treatment and Counted as One, uh, Tune In All These Years, and also The Complete Beatles Chronicle. And even though Mark Lewison really became a name, what, what, what put him on the map really was the Beatles recording sessions, um, the work that he did on the Beatles Live before that was extraordinary, and all the research that he did. And like you were saying, Alan, the Beatles, uh, the complete Beatles Chronicle, combines the work of the Beatles Live and the Beatles recording sessions. But it goes beyond that mm-hmm. because it also includes the BBC performances, all the interviews that they did for radio and for television. They have an index in the back with all their songs and all the BBC performances too. You know, it really is everything day by day of what they did. It's as complete as you could get. So, um, you know, if you don't have the Beatles live and you don't have the Beatles recording sessions, it's it's all covered right there in one book. Ken, uh, tell me, and Alan, you can tell me if I'm wrong, but isn't there information in recording sessions that's not in Chronicles? 
yeah, because it's a bit condensed. Yeah. Right. right. See, because I because if if I was going to choose one of Lewison's books, it'd be it would be recording sessions. That's me. Hmm. Um, the Chronicle stuff has, as, as Ken says, the live stuff and the TV and radio yeah, stuff. Right. It's, a, it's a trade-off. Um, obviously, you need them both. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah, and all their concerts, too. Mm-hmm. So, I also put in there, many years from now, from Barry Miles. Mm. And the reason mm. why I put that in is because, you know, many of us love when John talked about all the Beatles songs and, and some of the solo stuff in Playboy, and they wish that Paul had done the same. Well, he did it in this book. All his memories of writing the songs that he did in the Beatles or the songs that he co-wrote with John are in this book. So if you want some kind of document of any kind of, of Paul's side of the story, it's all in there. So I, And I mm-hmm. use this book a lot as a reference. And um, it's always interesting to compare what John said and what Paul said about the Lennon-McCartney songs. And very often they didn't agree as to how much each, each one contributed but it's interesting to hear Paul's perspective. And I also like this book a lot because Paul gives credit to the other Beatles on certain songs that we might not have known about. So it's it's a much more balanced book. It's not just all about him and what he contributed. Mm-hmm. He likes to give credit to the others. You know? Mm-hmm. Also, I have to mention Eight Arms to Hold You by Chip Mattinger and Mark Easter. Mm -hmm. Um, As far as a reference book on the solo Beatles, that's as good as you can get. My only regret is that it only goes up to 2000. But um, there's so much information about every single song from the solo careers of the Beatles. It was all collected and put together in this one book. And there's even information about all the bootlegs. You know, if there's different versions of different songs, it's there in that book. There's even a, a whole index of everything from the Lost Lennon tapes. Mm. in this book. So it's really, it's, it's complete. It tells you where you'll find every version of every solo song. And if it's on a bootleg, it says the name of the bootleg. <laughs> you know, if it was on Paul McCartney's Ubu Jubu radio series, it's in there. So it, it was very, very complete as far as documenting all the solo music through 2000. I really wish it would be updated, although... We know from what Chip and Alan have said that the two of them are working together on a book on Paul, which we're looking forward to. And Chip is working on one on Lennon, and part of which is out. And, and yes, right. And it's on my list. Yep. <laughs> also, um, I have to say, and it's really tough to pick, you got to put Bruce Spizer in there somewhere. Mm, sure. Yes. You know, um, which one's the best? How can you pick? I guess mm-hmm. maybe the Beatles on Capitol Records, Volumes 1 and 2. The thing I like about Bruce's work is that it's it's so thorough, and he's got photos of of everything, album covers, single sleeves, all of that. You know, he really does a fine job on all of his books. It's kind of tough to say this one's the best. Mm. And I have to put some fun tonight in there as well, because um, I love books that are thorough, and everything you'd ever want to know about every North American date from the Beatles is in there. You know, there may be too much information for some people. But it all comes down to the, the attendance, where, what hotel they stayed in, what airport they landed in, you know, how much security was involved in each show, what the cost was for security. You know, if you're into all that stuff and lots of stories as well, including all, all the opening acts for the Beatles from 64 through 66, Chuck Gunderson's book is, is really, it's just wonderful. You can't get any better than that for that. Mm-hmm. If you really want to zero in on that, that part of Beatle history. I'm wondering if we should have done a uh, separate list on reference and and non-reference books because there's because uh, you really run into a problem there trying to trying to separate the two. There there are so many great reference books. I mean, uh, Eight Arms is is one that I and and I forgot to mention Doug Selby who's done some fantastic mm. work. And I mean, I it, and I can I'm kicking myself now because I mean. His books have been, you know, have been go-to books for decades now, um, and and so I mean, yeah, I mean, it's it's really hard, you know. But in any yeah, event, it is. well, maybe next year we'll do uh, a two part. Yeah, there we go. Okay. So we'll, now we, uh, I'll, I'll I'll take my turn now. Um, uh, sadly, uh, many of my books have been chosen, and <laughs> um, this is the problem with going last, you know. Uh, and, uh, and then yeah. the other thing uh, is... Wait a minute, wait a minute. You forgot Al. 
It was Billy Preston. Yeah. No, <laughs> hell, really? Damn. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I won't go. Well, I won't go now. <laughs> it will be the executive editor for Beetle Fan. Okay. <laughs> that was good. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. No, nah, no problem. No problem. My I, I, with my list, I pretty much went old school. What a surprise, right? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, first one would be would be Love Me Do. Uh, mm-hmm. By Michael Braun, which uh, which Brad mentioned, uh, which came out here in America, actually in a magazine form uh, called The Real True Beatles, and that's how I first read it. And then I got was able to get a copy of the actual book uh, some years later by a friend who was uh, uh, working with me at ASCAP, and it's really the first kind of really honest look at what the Beatles were actually really like uh, during, you know, as, as Brad said, a particularly crucial period in their, uh, in their development in the, 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 the British tour in the fall of 63, and then the trip to Paris, and then the trip to America. And it's, uh, you know, because the other books that were coming out at that time were basically just, you know, teen magazine type of things. You know, even or even the 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 Billy Shepherd book, which was taken mainly from the very sanitized history of the Beatles that had been in the early Beatles monthlies. Um, you know, kind of an expanded version of that. So this was really the first kind of honest look, relatively honest look, at what the Beatles themselves were were really like at a you know a particularly crucial moment in their uh, in their history. Uh, the next one from 1975 and it's the Beatles an illustrated record by mm. Roy Carr and Tony Tyler which was kind of the first book that took a you know took a historical chronological look at the, at their recordings and did it in a you know a somewhat more critical somewhat more not I don't want to say cynical but certainly uh, a more objective viewpoint than you know than this is this is great and this is great and this is great and this is great you know mm-hmm. they actually you know and, and this is at a time when <laughs> before Beatle fan uh, before uh, you know before there was all that much objective sort of journalism about the Beatles mm-hmm. uh, plus it's visually it's a it's a really striking book uh they they did a uh an update of it uh in 1981 but uh, it's um uh it's a it's a really good book uh and at the same and at roughly the same time there came the first volume of the three harry castleman wally Petrazic books uh all together now which was really the first detailed discography mm-hmm. Of of the Beatles, you know, there had been other discographies, you know, that could be spread over three or four pages of a pamphlet, but this was the first one that really went into into detail, not only uh, not only of all the releases in England and in and in the U.S., but also Apple Records and and various and sundry other things, and of course the two volumes after that. Um, the Beatles again, and the um, uh, the end of the Beatles are also oh. uh, if you if you can find them mm-hmm. are you know are 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 really indispensable. Uh, <laughs> the, my my copy of the uh, the paperback version of All Together Now isn't even a book anymore. <laughs> um, yep. I probably would need to uh, get rubber bands together to keep them together. <laughs> They're I mean, there, there's no binding. That's how mm-hmm. much, and as Brad was saying before, that's how much they've been used. Um, that's funny. Mine's exactly the same way. It's yeah, right beside yeah, my yeah. bed with, with rubber band around it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do any, any of you guys have things we said today? A funny, funny name for it. Things we said today, the the one that goes through the um, the lyrics and uh, how, how much... Uh, how many times they use certain words and all that? Yeah, I have that. Isn't I? That's a fascinating book. I think that's a great book. Was that one of the Pierian Press books? Yes. 
Yeah. Okay. As yeah. was as was all together now. Oh um, yeah, right. That, right. Was, that was the first one, as a matter of fact. Right. But uh, yeah. yeah. And uh, but yeah, things we said today is is a is a great. Uh, you can still, I mean, you can still get all of them. I think um, you know some of them are more expensive than others. Not sure how. Say, mm-hmm. yeah. Not sure how much all together now goes for, but uh, um, but uh, the one I got was um, um, as I write this letter, I got that a couple of years ago, which right. yeah. was yeah. re- relatively cheap. I was surprised. I I I didn't pay very much for that, but. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know what was also great about All Together Now hmm. was the fact the most fascinating thing to me were all the side projects mm-hmm. of yes. mm-hmm. did for other people. Exactly. So I turn a page and I would see the song Fourth of July by John Christie written by right. Paul and Linda McCartney. And I would say, what, what is that? I would never have even known about yeah. some of these songs that the other Beatles wrote for other people or produced for other people or played on for other people had it not been for All Together Now. Yeah, that was, mm-hmm. fasc- that was fascinating. I remember yes. I yeah. spent many hours with that. that it's also fascinating that. to look at the, um, at the charts, the uh, Billboard and Melody Maker charts that are in All Together yes. Now. Yeah. 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 yeah you you also, find out things like... See, Leap Dick was at number 97, while She Loves You was at number one. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. They also have the, the original artists behind the songs, the Beatles covered, group and solo. And also, yeah. when they came out, was it a single? You know, what year did it come out? What was the B-side of the original recordings of the songs mm-hmm. that the Beatles yeah. put out? That took a lot of work, yeah. especially at that time. Uh, at that, especially at that yeah. time, because n- there really had never been a book like that before. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, the uh, like I said, the, the the only Beatles discographies there had been would be, you know, there would be like you know a five or six page uh, pamphlet that might be sold at a Beatles fest or something. Mm-hmm. You know, this was the first big, you know, Beatles reference book. Right. Mm. You know, the other thing about it, in a, in a way, and, and I'm pretty sure, I, I could guess that Al probably feels the same way, and, and mm-hmm. maybe you, but, you know, when I first, it, first saw that book as, you know, a Beatles collector geek, it really kind of made me think, wow, there were more of us. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah exactly. Yep. Yeah, it was true. Like, that it was an important. It was kind of like an important validation as well. You know, someone someone felt also that this stuff was important, and someone felt it was important enough to publish it. In fact, I don't know if you had the same feeling. I don't know how you obtained your your first copy, Alan. Uh, I ordered mine through the mail, I think, from Pierian Press, and I was practically counting the dates mm-hmm. until <laughs> this book arrived in the mail. Mm-hmm. That's how much I was anticipating it. So yeah, yeah, you're you're very right that it was it, it really did kind of validate being a hardcore fan. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like absolutely. Was crazy in those days, you know. Yeah, right, right. Exactly. And also, there are probably a lot of Americans that didn't know the British releases. Yeah, you know, just to see the British albums and also EPs. They probably never even yes. knew that there were EPs in England. Because yeah. it had only been maybe maybe a couple of years before that we had started getting to any great extent imports of the of the British Beatles albums, and they, and that may only have been you know on the East Coast through Gem Records. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't know about the rest of the country. I don't know mm-hmm. about you know where so, somewhere in Ohio, and that would okay. have been mid seventies or so. Okay, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. This is like as early as like seventy two. I remember at Sam Goody, uh, we uh, uh, we had them, but uh, but yeah, by the mid '70s, like you, like you say, Ken, a lot of people really you know didn't really know the differences mm. at all. So uh, so definitely, all together now, really was was an eye opener in that respect as well. Yeah, mm-hmm. Definitely, yeah. Yeah. Uh, next on my list is The Beatles Forever by Nicholas Schaffner. Mm. Which um, was is just as Brad said is just it's just a wonderfully written book. Nick was such a such a talented writer, and it's got it's it's such a you know it's such a tragedy that he died at such a young age. Uh, we a Beatle fan um, you know can never be you know objective at all about Nick because he was very much a part of the uh, the early years of the magazine. And um, 
but it was you know along with being so beautifully written it was it was also written from the from the point of view of an american fan mm-hmm. you know which most most of the other books the the kind of narrative books like the Be- uh, the beatles and illustrated record were written by Englishmen and written from the English uh, standpoint. This was written by a you know a young American fan, and so you know it told it told the you know the story of the Beatles beautifully in a narrative, but also told it from the perspective of the American fans. So that made it a, that made it a particularly special. And for, you know, for actually uh, he did a he later did kind of a children's version of that book called The, the, Lad, the Boys from, the Boys from Le- Liverpool. Boys from Liverpool. Yes, mm-hmm. exactly. And, you know, that's one that, you know, if you want to if, uh, if you have a uh, if you have a child and you want to give them an idea of the, you know, the Beatles story, that's a that's a very good place to start. But the Beatles Forever is um, is is great, and uh, I did sneak in one Mark Lewison book because the Beatles recording sessions was the release of that was an absolute event, you know, with a capital E, and there weren't there weren't a whole lot of Beatles, you know, at least positive Beatles events in the eighties, and I, I remember is this was at a Beatle Fest. In probably '86 or '87, uh, Mark was a guest there after the Beatles Live had been released, and we were talking with him, and he mentioned the fact that he had been given permission to go into the EMI tape library and basically write a basically an authorized book on the the complete Beatles recording sessions and you could almost see our, our, our jaws drop <laughs> to the ground. And when, when that book came out in, uh, I guess it was early, I think it was early. It, it was, it was October of 1988. Oh, it was yeah. 88. Yeah. Okay. I knew it was either at late 88 or early 89. Uh, and that was definitely, uh, it was an absolute event mm-hmm. with a, with a capital E, what what makes for me what also makes that whole experience memorable is that the first volume of the ultra rare tracks bootleg came yes, out at about, roughly at the about, same time exactly the same time yeah because I remember I went down to Atlanta uh-huh. to visit Bill King the publisher of Beetle Fan and um, and his son Bill at that time was three years old. And they had they had gotten ultra rare tracks, both of the two volumes. Mm-hmm. And if you remember, one had a green cover and one had a red cover. Mm-hmm. And three year old Bill would be would be requesting, you know, in the car saying, "Play play green, play green Beatles, Daddy." <laughs> oh, wow, we had to do a whole show on on the, on the coming of those albums. I mean, those were. Those were just an ama- uh, just a, a huge monumental thing. Um, yeah, exactly. And you know, and people, of course, you know, there were people suspecting that that you know that it was Mark. Who right. Was, oh yeah, he he fought that. that. And as it turned out, it wasn't. Mm-hmm. But uh, but there were you know there were those suspicions. And uh, but the the but the book itself is just uh, it's an it's another one of those books that you just go to time after time after time after time mm-hmm. to, you know for uh for information and, i still do i still yeah. do for my radio yeah. work yep 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 me too and then for uh you know for an honorable mention i would basically say the entire bruce spicer catalog mm-hmm. mm-hmm. yeah. you know because all of those books are uh are are absolutely magnificent. Uh, you know, if there's maybe maybe one to get that's uh, maybe more affordable than some of the others. Of course, now you can get the uh, I think the first three, the two Capital books and the VJ book, much less expensively now as uh, as digital right. versions. 
Right. But also the one that's still available as a uh, you know as a you know hard copy is uh, the Beatles are coming, right. which is you know which I have said in in changing times is the the absolute you know that is the book about the breakthrough of the Beatles in America. Mm-hmm. It's and you know plus the fact that it just it reads so well because Bruce is Bruce is such a talented writer. Yeah, and of course, him, you know, it was Bruce who was able to uh, unearth that, you know, that very important nugget that the Alexander Kendrick report um, on CBS News aired the morning of November 22nd, 1963, and was scheduled to run on the CBS Evening News of Walter Cronkite that night before the fates intervened. Mm-hmm. And... Um, that's that's a that's a very important uh, piece of information. But all of Bruce's books are you know are, are worth uh, you're worth your interest definitely. And uh, like I said, the the digital books and and actually with the digital books you can do things now with them. And there's more information in there that is not the original book. He automatically updates them too. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So. So that's that's my list. Yep. Now, okay. Alan. Can I go? Can I go? <laughs> Time, <we're> up. Time's up. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that we're in. <laughs> All right. Go ahead, okay. Alan. Okay. So for me, it, it was a big problem because uh, I mean, apart from that, I knew that most of my books would be you know discussed by <laughs> everyone else. <laughs> Uh, the the thing is that actually a lot of these guys are my pals, you know. I mean, um, Steve Marinucci published a picture on, I guess, uh, on Facebook and in uh, on one of his other lines of a of of my wedding, where you know my yeah. my incredible wife is in the middle and surrounded by you know me and Lewis and, and Richard Buskin and Jonathan Wally. Gould and Wally Pedrazic and Bill King, and and it was sort of like right. you know. Beatles, and, and she, in fact, had made a, a video to show at the wedding of, like, everybody's books um, <laughs> uh, with Paperback Writer as the soundtrack. So, uh, you know, by, I, I don't you – know, on one hand, I, I wish I could include all the books that I really would like on the list, but, um, you know, there are just certain things, like, you know, and, 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 and what I choose today might not be what I choose tomorrow, and – you know, because there are a lot of great books out there. I mean, the the, the Beatles bookshelf, um, or in my case, the Beatles wall of books, is uh, is an incredible thing. You know, people have done a lot of good pioneering work. So, you know, I mean, I, I looked at um, a, a lot of things, and you know, a, a lot of you chose things that were like you know near and dear from the early years of collecting, like Nick Schaffner. And Wally's books, which, you know, are, are, of course, musts. And um, I was very tempted also to include Hunter Davies, because even though it's been sort of expurgated by the Beatles themselves, who apparently went through it and ripped out whole sections. Mm -hmm. um, Nevertheless, I mean, that was the first really serious Beatles biography. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, there was a but so early. This is 1968. I, and, I mentioned and, it a little bit too, yeah. Yeah, and he has, you know, eyewitness accounts of them working on, you know, basically writing with a little help from my friends and mm-hmm. other things, and you know, and that's uh, that's important stuff. So I, I've always had a soft spot for Hunter Davies. So I'll include him and get rid of one of the ones that you guys have already <laughs> mentioned. Yeah. <laughs> also, um, Walter Everett's two books, The Beatles as hmm. Musician. Yeah. Okay. Since I'm often identified when you guys do the intros as the, the group musicologist, I guess I should, you know, in deference to my musicological colleague, you know, Walter's books are for people who understand, you know, how music works using the terminology of music mm-hmm. theory and all that. So they're, you know, they're not light reads, but, you know, here's the thing. Walter... Uh, and before him, to some extent, Tim Riley, um, who was at my wedding too, <laughs> and, <laughs> and um, uh, Terence O'Grady. I don't know if you, you guys have his book. You know, these were the first books that really looked in detail. And I, I guess Wilfred Mellers, but Wilfred mm-hmm. Mellers yeah. 
you know, Twilight of the Gods was written, you know, by someone who liked the Beatles but somehow didn't quite understand the ethos, you know, the, the, the thing. You, you know, he, he kind of could analyze them as tunes, but he didn't quite get it. Um, Terrence O'Grady got it a lot more, and Tim, but Walter's books were the first books where you've got, okay, here is a really serious musicologist who could take apart, you know, a, a, a Bach cantata or a Mahler symphony or a Stockhausen and, and give, a, you know, a paper that the Musicological Society of America would, would accept and, you know, listen to seriously, but who absolutely knew what was going on in Beatles records and who was doing what and why and what it was supposed to mean and what the outtakes were. You know, it's he's got it all. And if you have musical training and want to read that level of analysis, Walter Everett's books are the ones to get. There are two volumes. I think one goes up through Rubber Soul and the other one goes through from there to Abbey Road, um, The Beatles as Musicians. Let's see. I had also included, uh, I thought about Bruce Spizer and his many books because they are really standard references. And also the one I chose was on Al's um, uh, special extra mention list. Uh, the Beatles are coming. Um, that mm-hmm. really you know, get to the bottom of a lot of uh, what went on in America and the marketing of the Beatles as they were coming here. It's very important. And uh, when I was working on um, You Got That Something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Change Everything, um, Bruce's book was invaluable. I mean, it, it had it had a lot of, it, it answered a lot of questions for me and pointed mm-hmm. me in the right directions as well. Here's one that hasn't been mentioned. Recording the Beatles by uh, mm. <laughs> and yes. Brian. Yes. So they don't do all the Beatles songs the way Mark Lewison did in his recording sessions, but the ones they did go into incredible depth about how they did them. And the first section of the book details every single piece of EMI equipment that could be found in the Abbey Road studios when the Beatles were there and how they used them. Mm-hmm. So that is a remarkable resource. They published it themselves. They started an imprint called Curve Bender Books to do it. I, I think, you know, these days self-publication in the Beatles world is a major, major thing. Mm-hmm. You know, when people growing up, self-publication was kind of looked at, you know, a bit askance, you know. It's like, okay, it's vanity press, Right. But with the Beatles in particular, and it may be the case in other fields too, but with the Beatles, um, self-publication has given people the ability to control the quality of the printing and the paper and the pictures Mm -hmm. and have complete editorial control. And some really, really important stuff has come out that way. Bruce's books are are Mm -hmm. Um, Mm self-published. Recording the Beatles, Chuck Gunderson's um, Mm -hmm. Some Fun Mm -hmm. Night. Mm-hmm. which is also on my list that I may kick it off since it's been on everybody else's list. But, you know, see, these things are not vanity publications. These things are, are, are labors of love, and yeah. uh, and they're immensely valuable to all of us who spend a lot of time with this. I wanted to include many years from now as well, um, and I'm, mm-hmm. I guess – because so far only Ken did, so that's only one of the five of us. Mm-hmm. Uh, and years from now is, you know, as close as Paul's done to an autobiography. Um, and, you know, he talks at great length about an awful lot of stuff. Beatles era, really, not much solo stuff. Which, you know, there should be a many year, years from now part two. I'll help but, him with that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, you know, if you want to know not just about the songs, but for instance, if you want to know exactly what Paul McCartney thought of, say, oh, Magic Alex, it's in that book. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Leninology, the first installment of Chip Mattinger, and we always say Chip, but it, it's also Chip and Scott Riley. You know, the two of them are the co authors of that. You know, it's the first volume is basically. A, a very, very detailed annotated diary of, of John's career. I mean, almost day by day tells you what he was doing. And, and I mean, the next parts are going to be the discography parts, um, which will be really, really interesting. But this, if you want to know 
what and when and where something was recorded and and what John was doing around it. Um, Leninology, the the first volume of Strange Days, it, uh, maybe Strange Days indeed. Anyway, uh, the first volume is something to look for. Again, that is a self published. Thing. And um, I guess I, I should, uh, as a disclaimer, say that Chip is also in the team that is doing uh, the McCartney legacy, which I'm doing with Chip and um, Adrian Sinclair, which will be okay. the McCartney version of this. Mm-hmm. Uh, so let's see. I, I know I managed to sneak in more than five there, so I should uh, call it a day. But, um, you know, I mean, all of these books that you guys have mentioned, have you know been really important and uh you know lewison's recording sessions for instance uh that in a way was the serious start of the beatles desk at the new york times because um although i had done a lot of beatles beatles writing before then uh had reviewed the cds for instance the first cds the 87 ones oh, right. mm-hmm. <laughs> the editors really took it seriously after the piece about mark's book um, which was also, you know, the first time I got to talk to Mark. And so, you know, and that became a, a great friendship. And, um, you know, it was just a, a you know, thrill to you know, read the book and then, you know, talk to him about how he did it. But the early edition of that story came out with a photo of Ringo, Paul, and George Martin at the console, you know, pushing the faders. And the photo editor who wrote the caption wrote, Paul and Ringo with an unidentified producer. <laughs> and, wow. wrote. and one of our copy editors saw it when the first edition came out and immediately fixed it. So for most of the country, you know, it, 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 uh, it was fixed, but the first edition goes out and goes, you know, far and wide. And we got sacks of mail from people blaming me, you know, like I'd get these letters saying, you turkey, you can't identify George Martin. And I'm thinking, you know, come on, you know, you read the piece. Don't you think I can identify? George Martin? <laughs> and I went to the photo editor and I said, why, why did, how is it possible <laughs> you did this? And he said to me, uh, well, in my opinion, music ended in 1827. Yeah. Now, uh, like me, are also classical music critics, know that 1827 is the year that Beethoven died. But I said to him, you know, excuse me, but that is my determination to make. Yours is to identify people in captions. <laughs> <laughs> wow. But, you know, because, um, because we got so much mail complaining about that caption, suddenly the culture editor began coming to me like every three weeks saying, uh, so what's going on with the Beatles? And it's like, by now it's 1988, 89. And I'm saying, you know, they, they, they broke up in 1970. I, I'm not sure what I can, what I can do for you this week, but it was great, you know, having the encouragement to keep finding new Beatles stories, which is what Steve does today, basically on a daily basis. Mm-hmm. But thank you. So, mm-hmm. Let me ask one more question. Uh, I, I've been, going through Amazon while we've been talking. And uh, anybody uh, have anything to say about Ellery King's bootleg books? Remember those? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Are, mm. I, 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 I remember them vaguely. Mm-hmm. But I, yeah. Oh, they were really good, yeah. I spent a lot of time with those. I mean, I those were those were geek central, you know, for bootleg information. Uh, you know, Doug's too. But, I mean, those were those were... Uh, other uh, really good books, and they're still they're still out there. I but they're a little on the expensive side now. They're not cheap yeah. anymore. But. Um, I think he did kind of a an annotated sort of companion to the Lost Lennon tapes, if I remember correctly. He did, yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Does anyone else remember a Perian Press book that came out in the early '80s called "You Can't Do That"? Oh, yes. Yeah. Charles Reinhardt. Yeah, yeah that oh. was a great yeah. book. Yeah. 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 Charles- the guy who ran the company, wasn't he? I yes. think so. Yes, he was. I'm Schultheis. That oh, no, you're right, right, you're right, you're right. That's right, too. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Schultheis um, did, a bo- did a book, and I can't remember which one it is. Uh, it was called right. A Day in the Life, uh, but unfortunately, he he put in there stuff that wasn't actually accurate, plus stuff from 
paperback writer, you know, the Mark Shipper book mm -hmm. and other stuff. So it wasn't all that reliable as a reference. <laughs> it was fun, though. I remember. It was, oh, yeah. It was oh, yeah. 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 Paperback Writer is a book I haven't read in years, but it is oh, quite yeah. funny. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of fan fiction, but that one book, the very first fan fiction Beatles book was I mean, that was just great. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Do we have any thoughts on the worst Beatles books by any chance? Well, I know one one author we can mention and we'll, that will probably get us sued, but um, yeah, so don't, don't mention. You mean, I don't think we I don't think we should mention it. Uh, does, well, is, is, does his last name begin with a G? Yes. yes. Yeah. Who? Okay. Who? Mm. Goldman. Yeah, Goldman. Oh God, that that, that that's a horrible. Oh, no, no, that's no, not, no, no. That's not who I was thinking. Of. No, I know, yeah. I know who you're really? thinking of. I know who you're yeah. thinking of. Um, yeah. As far as we've talked about Goldman before, and 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 one thing, Alan, I remember you said previously was that he actually had some stuff in there that nobody else did. Goldman? Yeah, didn't he? Mm, yeah, you mean like true stuff? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I thought that's what you said. Much. I know he was the first one to report that the Beatles' early records came out on 78s. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> and that John's uh, uh, first song was, was uh, uh, called Ain't It a Shame, uh, the first song he learned. Okay. Uh, Fats Domino, uh, who, who, although I think he said Fats Waller. Uh, <laughs> uh, Wendy, Wendy Carlos was a Japanese composer. Oh, uh, ooh. No, never, I, never mind. I, 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 my memory failed me. Okay, yeah, forget that it. Was, that, to me, that's the most useless of Beatles books, but um, hey. And the shame is that it was so probably read by so many people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, well, I some... My wedding. <laughs> There's yeah. a lot of Beatles books that's loaded with inaccuracies, especially oh, yeah. especially a lot of the trivia books. Mm. So yeah. Well, even some of the some of the, the narrative ones, the Bob Spitz book is probably one that mm. comes that comes to mind, mm -hmm. Mm. which yeah. is rife with uh, inaccuracies. <laughs> Can I mention a few more honorable mentions that we haven't brought up? Why not? Okay. Um, John Lennon in My Life from Pete Shotton. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I always enjoyed that book. And when you think about it, outside of the Beatles or anybody that worked with John in a creative capacity, who was closer to John throughout his childhood years than Pete Shotton? Right. And, you know, he really presented him in a way that I think was, it was um, careful, it was tactful, but it was truthful. And, you know, there's there's the the darker side of John that was shown in the book, too. But, you know, I felt that it was very accurate and believable. Mm -hmm. um, the David Bedford books I like, Liddy Pool mm -hmm. and 5104. Liddy Pool yeah. especially was, is, a, is a great book. Um, but, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I especially love Ken Sharp's book, Starting Over. Anything you'd ever want to know about the double fantasy sessions from all the people who participated, from mm -hmm. the musicians to even the photographer that was hired, mm -hmm. and the engineers, and even quotes from John and Yoko. It's all there in the book. So, yeah. Um, I mean, mine, George, I would definitely put in there because like we were talking about John talking about all of his Beatles songs and Playboy and Paul and many years from now. George talked about all of his songs, well, most of them, through 1979 in that book. So, mm -hmm. it's, it's, you know, you got to have that one. There's a new expanded edition coming out. Right. right. I can't wait for that. Um, and then there's John Lennon. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Come Together. John Lennon, yeah. John Lennon in his own time. That was so, mm -hmm. so so detailed about the whole FBI investigation on him, and that paved the way for other things like the U.S. versus John Lennon movie. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. The Robert Rodriguez books I like, Kid O'Toole's book, of course, mm -hmm. songs were singing, mm -hmm. and also Luca Parasi, the Paul McCartney recording sessions book, um, mm -hmm. his music from 1969 through 2013. You know, everything you'd want to know about all those songs, it's in there. The ones that he wrote, actually. Mm -hmm. I think we, uh, none of us, I'm surprised, mentioned the Kevin Hollett BBC book. Oh, mm. yeah. Yeah, was, yeah which uh, it was surprising. Yeah. I mean, that's another that's another uh, um, really good book. I mean, you, you know, you, for reference, you can't get away from the detail in that book. 
That's um, for sure. What we really needed to do is have each have a show where mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. we each have the whole show to talk about all the Beatles books that, that are important to us. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, there's just there's just so many. Um, but yeah. So. Well, no one has mentioned communism, hypnotism, and the Beatles yet. Oh, oh I, yes, I do. I, I, ha- I do have that. Um, yeah. I, I have several of his books. They're a hoot. But you know what? Know weird about those books. Okay, David. You know, David Nobel is one of these guys who writes books about. You know, my my parody version of his books are like you know, communism, the Beatles, and your mm-hmm. daughter. Um, <laughs> yep. You know, they're they're basically alarmist books about how the Beatles are part of some you know massive leftist conspiracy. To, you Alec, know, Alex Jones would have written it today had 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 uh, had it been written today. Yeah, you know, I, I, he's probably still alive. I mean, I have a book that he did about Lenin that was, uh, you know, bit after Lenin died. Um, but the, the the interesting thing about David Nobel's books is his bibliographies. That guy has everything, you know. I mean, there's a, he. It's very, very, very thorough and. Um, it gave me uh, an idea for I was I was at one point going to write and, and may, who knows still write a novel about um, these guys who basically are um, geek collectors who uh, decide to do a heist of some major unreleased material um, and they decide that they're going to practice on David Nobel because they realize by looking at his bibliography that although he's writing these alarmist anti-Beatles books, he actually has an incredible collection of Beatles research material. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. His house and steal the Beatles research material. And when they do, he catches them and they say, well, you know, we, we've decided that you actually, uh, you know, you don't, you don't really deserve to have all the stuff you have. And, and he thinks for a minute and he says, OK, come on. And he takes him into a room and he's got a, you know, Paul McCartney stage suit from Shea and he's got instruments and he's got, you know, he has an incredible collection. And it turns out that he's another geeky Beatles collector who has financed his collection by writing these books and selling them to evangelicals. <laughs> <laughs> wow. This is fiction, folks. It's not just, you know. Um, if I ever do that novel, uh, you can read all about it. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I was was struck looking at his his bibliography. It's, it, it, he, it's very very thorough. So um, yeah, David Nobel. Who'd have thought we'd be mentioning that guy? <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> that book, Communism, Hypnotism, and the Beatles, is actually on a list of books I would like to get my hands on at some point. I'd love to get Fifty Years Adrift too, the Derek Taylor mm. um, Genesis yeah. Publications book, and it would be great if the widows of George and Derek mm. would allow that book to come out in a trade form. Right. Mm-hmm. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, one other, yeah. one other important book that I'm surprised none of us mentioned was Jeff Emmerich's. Here, there, and everywhere. Oh, yeah. yeah. So there's another one that uh, I, I'm not trying to, you know. I mean, just and George I, Martin's I, books. And, and George Martin's books, yeah, yeah too. I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah. There's there's more, and uh, yeah, uh, you know, I, you're absolutely right about the about the uh, 50 years of drift. I'd love to, and there there is one, and I can't remember the name of it now, and I'm going to have to look it up here while we're sitting here. That uh, was available. Oh, as time goes by, Derek Taylor. Oh yeah. Oh yes. Yeah. Which actually you can get relatively cheaply. I'm looking here on Amazon now, and there's a paperback for like eight dollars, which is really not bad at all. It is a good book, and he also wrote a book about um, the Summer of Love. Yes. Right. Yeah. It was 20 years ago today. Right, but the yeah. as time goes by is about Apple and the Beatles. Uh, I don't know that. I don't yeah. think Summer of Love is more is not just about the Beatles though. But uh, yeah, as time goes right. by, is is really about the Beatles too. It goes into his yeah. work at the Beach Boys and his work at Warner. Yeah, that's true. Mm-hmm. But really, yeah. the drift is is brilliant. It, you know, that is a great. That was the first Genesis book I ever got, and then got I Me Mine later, which came out first. But um, yeah, I mean, in fact, we should we should sort of nod to all the other Genesis books. Um, yeah. Because they, yeah. Have done some incredible, especially you know, and then once they branched into photography, 
they began, you know, they put out books of Astrid stuff and Jürgen Vollmer and, uh, and... And the one from Ringo from last and, year. Mm-hmm. Two yes. from Photographs. They, they did two. They also did... Uh, the the Postcards one. book. Right. Yeah. right. Postcards for the boys. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I was looking at, they did a book of Stuart Sutcliffe's paintings. And, uh, yeah, they have quite a lot. And, you know, and they've got the one coming out of the pictures from Japan that I wrote the intro to. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So, yeah, there, and um, I should also mention there are two other curve bender books besides recording the Beatles. Mm-hmm. Um, they put out two books of Henry Grossman's Beatles photos. And, you know, Henry is an incredible guy who, you know, he when Kennedy was assassinated, the New York Times front page had portraits of Kennedy and Johnson. And they were both by Henry, who at the time was in his 20s. Mm-hmm. Um mm-hmm. He got an assignment to cover the Beatles and, you know, early on and went and shot a bunch of photos and became friends with them, friendly enough that they allowed him to shoot pictures uh, with their families, which weren't generally uh, allowed at the time. They tried to keep the families out of it, um, especially the kids. And he was given permission to publish some of those. And now they're there are more of them in in uh, places I remember, which is the second book. And the first one, Kaleidoscope Eyes, was he was at a, a, a pepper session for one particular night when they were recording Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. And it's a, a thick book. You know, you see the session basically from beginning to end and, you know, lots of detail. And it's it's just they're just great books to have if you like photography. Right. I have books. I have one one minor complaint about Genesis is that most of the books are just uh, you know for they're so expensive uh, they're so expensive and it would be really nice if they would put out you know um, popular versions of each of their of at least yeah. the Beatle books so that everybody because yeah. Uh, yeah it's really too bad but well you know, I, I I understand I you know it's true they they really ought to but you know they're, the whole point of that press originally was that it was like, you know, artisanal bookmaking. Mm-hmm. Everything's mm-hmm. handmade and it's, you know, very carefully done and and that's the standard that they want and that's expensive, you know. Um no, but, I, yeah. I, I, I I get that. I mean I could live without I mean if if I'm gonna pay that much less money, I'm obviously not gonna get the signatures and all that. You know, I just yeah. wanna I would like to read Derek Taylor's <laughs> book. That's the point. Yeah, that's true. Me too. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I understand what you mean. And yeah, I kind of wish they, they they would do that too. I mean, they did, did it with I Me Mine, and the new I Me Mine's going to have a, a trade version too. Mm-hmm. And the expensive one, obviously, isn't going to be signed. So, um, <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, I guess we should uh, reluctantly wrap up. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we could keep going. <laughs> it's really good. So and, and and this is without actually I, I've done this my part of it anyway without actually looking at my bookshelf during the show. If we were to start looking at the books, it would be even worse. I know. Uh, I, I, did, I didn't either. I I didn't even bother to look. I just kind of went off a of memory. So. Okay. So you can contact us at things we said today radio show at gmail dot com. Send us emails, um, complaints questions, ideas for shows, anything you want. We've been getting a lot of email lately, and at some point we'll try and catch up with some of those because people have been um, saying some really interesting things, um, and uh, we'd like to acknowledge those, but keep them coming. Um, You can follow us on Twitter with the uh, at symbol things we said fab, and we have a Facebook page, things we said today, Beatles radio fans. And we'll go around and just get contact information from everyone. Let's start with Brad. How do people get in touch with you if they want to? Probably the best way to get in touch with would be I have a Facebook page as well, and my my last name is spelled H U N D T, so it's a little bit of an unusual spelling. But probably the best way to get in touch would be by email, which is B W Hunt H U N D T at Yahoo dot com. Um, Steve. Uh, you can get me at uh, BeatlesExaminer at gmail.com. I have a Facebook page with my name. I have a Facebook page or a, a Facebook 
Beatles News Group called Beatles News and Commentary. Uh, and I also monitor you if you post a note on the things we said today uh, Facebook page. It's likely that I'm going to answer it. Actually, we all might answer it, but um, but yeah, um, that's where you can get me. Okay, Al? Uh, Facebook, uh, Al Sussman. Uh, Twitter, at A-S-U-S-S 49 or www.beetlefan.com for Beetle Fan Magazine. Also, I've been on a very quick uh, uh, plug. Uh, last week, Alan Haber and I uh, taped about a half hour show, which Alan calls Two Owls Talking Tunes, and uh, which is going to be kind of a uh, an occasional thing. And uh, we did a show on uh, uh, Sunshine Pop, both American and British, uh, just about a half hour. I think it'll be running within the next couple of weeks on Alan Haber's Pure Pop Radio. Okay. All right. Wow. Ken, what you got going on? Uh, my Facebook page is Ken Michaels. You gotta look for the photo with me, my wife, son, and Todd Rundgren. That'd be me. My email address is everylittlething at att.net. And my website is kenmichaelsradio.com. Uh, always go to the website for weekly Beatles trivia. Your chance to win one of nine incredible prizes every week and lots of great interviews. Okay, and you can... Reach me at on Facebook at either Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed, my there you go. And for the rest of the guys here at Things Said Today, I uh, thank you for listening and we'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.